And as I always say, words are but a second language to me. I'm going to try through visual imagery and stitch some words together to explain how it came that somebody normally standing around in a stone shed turning good stone to dust ended up being in the Seattle Art Museum with a theoretical nuclear physicist talking about art in the nuclear age, art and healing in the nuclear age, I might add. I may sound inadvertently like an intellectual. It's, a, it's not at all true. My ideas start in little solitary rooms at midnight. Uh, I, sort of, I sort of stumble and find my way as I go. I spend a lot of time drawing bones, seeds. I was looking especially for ways in which nature used more than one concentration or more than one material in creating a single unified whole. I thought of the way in which stone and metal work together, stone being sort of a universal primal substance with which to create sculpture. In any event, as any thoughtful observer will notice, many of the traditional stones of sculpture are not holding up nearly as well as they used to. Like this being in front of the old Seattle Art Museum, many of you will recognize that. I sat on that stone carving as a child. Only granite really is holding up well today in today's polluted, corrosive environment. This is a curbstone in downtown Seattle about three blocks from here. So I looked amongst all of the granites as being a stone permanent and durable enough to hold up in today's outside, outdoor, polluted environment. The ones that came from New England I liked the best, the nice light gray stone. In my usual way, I moved to Barry, Vermont in the late 1970s to get access to the stone that I wanted to be able to use there. Uh, not only was the best stone from there, but in fact it was a town, it was a city that was based around the technology of the Stone Age. Not only would I be able to get the stone that I wanted, but I would get access to the technology, be able to tap into the reservoir of skills that the craftsmen and stone workers there had. I went to work full time as a sculptor. 40 hour a week job was a union job actually. I was a journeyman sculptor in the Granite Cutters International of America. Carving tombstones by the zillion, I must have one in every cemetery in the United States. <laughs> well, after I'd been there a year, I did what I'd always wanted to do. I purchased stone that was still attached to the earth, right here and where the V of the derrick comes together against the dark shadow. I purchased this block of stone. Months later, it got moved up to the edge of the quarry. I took my tools up from work, split it out, got it ready to go down to the saw shop, got it sawn, moved it to my own studio. And in the true tradition of mid-career emerging artists everywhere, I went to work nights and weekends creating my own piece. Now, of course, I wanted to use metal and stone together. I wanted to use a metal that was compatible with the granite. But I also had this idea that I wanted to use a metal that was associated with the stone itself. In fact, it turns out granite's the most radioactive of all the traditional materials of sculpture. Granite contains enough uranium that if uranium prices double here in the next few years for some reason, Lo and behold, this granite that I was carving would be mined for its uranium content. Well, this was terribly disappointing news to me. I was looking for corrosion-resistant metals. You know, uranium was anything but that. But I guess because I was doing so much religious carving in my full-time job, I was aware of the concept of creating reliquaries, which were sculptures especially popular in the Middle Ages that were designed to carefully preserve a fragile object of veneration, perhaps, that would be safely contained within the sculpture. So I thought to myself, okay, well, I'll go ahead to the clay pattern on the carved glove. I'll go ahead, I'll cast that in stainless steel. But when it comes time to use the uranium, I'll just place it safely inside the carved granite sculpture. So I moved back to Seattle. Got a studio set up in Fremont, went to work finishing the carvings that I had done. I also got to do the delicate work for some of my colleagues on their stone jobs. I was all fresh on this stuff. I'm helping a famous Northwest sculptor, Brian Goldblum, there put the finishing touches on one of his big things. <laughs> I returned to that thought, well, what about the uranium? You know, I mean, it didn't seem like a very important idea in some ways, but yet it was kind of an important idea. So I began checking around. I mean, uranium, uranium, uh, how hard is it to get out of granite? Well, it turned out it was pretty hard. You know, it can take boiling vats of acid and giant rock crushers, you know, and I thought, wait a minute, this is ridiculous. I only need a little bit. Everybody's trying to get rid of it. Nobody knows what to do with it. So why should I get involved in all this? So, I, and I, I have to uh, blush when I say this, but I knew so little about it, I called up the Trojan nuclear power plant and asked them if I could have some nuclear waste. I said, look. <laughs> 
I'm a real responsible guy, you know, a serious, hardworking artist. I don't need very much, a cup, you know, maybe a pound. I don't know how you guys sell it. I'd be willing to come down to my pickup and get it. But it turns out, you know, that you're either in the club or you're not in the club. So. But I did find that there were certain sources of uranium that were not regulated. And I'll call your attention to the orange plates in the slide on the left. Fiesta wear, many of you know the story, but that characteristic red-orange color was produced by triuranium octoxide, which I then proceeded to enter the nuclear age. Working in Fremont in a small studio, I didn't quite have the hang of what I was doing yet. I read my learning curve on this went straight up. But my initial idea was to extract the uranium from all these chipped and broken Fiesta wear plates, get them all crushed up and uh, put them inside these sculptures. Well, I am kind of a process sculptor. I mean, I, I like learning how to do things and do it. And it wasn't long before I realized, geez, uranium, twice as heavy as gold, you know, how to be able to separate the uranium from the underlying ceramic. And in spite of everything you hear about the enormous expense and complexity of nuclear industry, I find these 7-Eleven sandwich trays perfectly for separating the uranium from the underlying glaze. So I was having a pretty good time, you know, a serious, hardworking, emerging mid-career sculptor. Uh, extracting gram quantities of uranium from pounds and pounds of broken plates and getting ready to put them inside these carved granite sculptures. And you know, a funny thing happened. This wasn't a very popular project. People were concerned. All, there was all kinds of concern expressed. Personal friends were concerned about my safety and health. Neighbors were concerned. Uh, some people voiced concern that I would give uh, undeserved credibility to the evil nuclear scientists, many of which lurked over at Hanford. My troubles were just beginning. I got called in by a group called the Washington State Radiation Control. They had heard that there was a sculptor working with radioactive materials, and they called me in. And I said, well, look, Fiesta wear, it's exempt, right? I looked it up in the rules and regulations, no problem. Well, they went down to Olympia, which is where the state radiation control offices were, and they had a conference on it, and they said, yes, Mr. Acord, your work with Fiesta Ware uh, is basically exempt, but we've decided your use of it constitutes mining and milling of uranium. <laughs> there are only two uranium mines in the, in the state of Washington, and they pay a, a little over a quarter of a million dollars a year in their license. And I said, well, geez, you know, I'm glad you're taking my work seriously, but this is, you know, it's a pretty expensive license, you know. I'm having trouble paying rent in Fremont, you know. <laughs> so, well, I started a dialogue with Washington State Radiation Control in which I started explaining about what art was. They want to know, oh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm making sculpture, right? Well, what is art? I mean, why, why, why are you making our lives miserable with this radioactive material? I mean, I've started pointing out, well, you know, I mean, we human beings have been making sculpture a long time. It seems to be some sort of fundamental uh, instinct inside us. Sculpture is an art of technology. Uh, nuclear technology, you know, I mean, it's got to be something that we can use in sculpture. I mean, and the dialogue was based on the fact that my Fiesta wear, I could only own 15 pounds of it at any one time, 150 pounds in a calendar year, nor could I break the plates. I, I could not break the plates as a way of extracting. Well, I mean, I was getting serious about this by this time, so I bagged up all my Fiesta wear into 14 and a half pound bags and distributed them amongst what friends I had left. <laughs> the label reads, radioactive materials Limited quantity, no label required. And that is, in fact, the required label for Fiesta Wear. <laughs> I was going to learn a lot as I went through this. It was a show sponsored by 911, curated by Helen Slate. It was part of a larger show titled Civilization. I'm sure some of you probably saw it. And it gave me a venue to talk a little bit about what I was trying to accomplish or do with my artwork. One of the most popular pieces in the show was the home reactor, powered by Fiesta Wear. <laughs> This reactor, unlike anything offered by General Electric, Siemens, or, G or Westinghouse, this reactor requires no environmental impact statement, can be transported in a pickup truck down the street, and you can buy the fuel for it out of secondhand stores. Well, in any event, it was sort of an aside. I guess I was still, still not quite sure what I was doing, but I had moved to Richland. And in Richland, I found a lot of things. They had real reactors over there, and they had this huge sense of scale, and they were set on this landscaped desert. They were made out of the materials, the, the most advanced stainless steels, alloys like zirconium and titanium, words that didn't even mean anything to me. The quality of craftsmanship, the workers that worked there, I began to become familiar 
with the shapes that were associated with nuclear process. And I want to interject something here that I don't really have words for, but it, it remains a very important thing for me. The ordered arrangement of mass and void can be thought of as the principle behind sculpture. And it turns out it's the ordered arrangement of mass and void that makes nuclear process possible. And I feel in some way that I still can't articulate that somehow art and physics have a real fundamental commonality there. All right, so what I had was, I had the materials at my disposal that I wanted to be able to use. I was living in the midst of a skilled workforce. But in a way, I'd missed the whole point, that the reason for the quality of all of this craftsmanship and all this process and material technology was in response to the needs of nuclear process itself. The fast flux test facility reactor, second generation, liquid metal cooled, nuclear reactor being used as a test bed. I knew nothing more about it than that until I saw an article in the paper saying that the United States Department of Energy and their prime contractor was going to make the fast flux test facility reactor available to private users. I thought, aha, an opportunity to use America's most advanced nuclear reactor for the creation of art. How hard can it be? <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, in for a penny, in for a pound. I always compare things with carving granite. You know, I always say it can't be any harder than carving granite. That'd be a way to learn about it. I kind of had a hunch on what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to change elemental substances using the capabilities that makes the nuclear age what they are. So I, so I wrote a series of proposals. You know, would it be possible for me to create a large granite and stainless steel sculpture, perhaps using uh, zirconium and zirconium alloys, the corrosion resistant, beautiful alloys that I fell in love with originally, and then incorporate milligram quantities of what had been a high level radioactive waste and had now been converted into a stable member of the platinum family. So I got off my first rounds of applications about a year ago, and uh, you know, I think these things move real slow. The United States Department of Energy, they're slow to make up their mind about you know, whether or not they want to get involved in a conceptual art project or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a wonderful break. There was a, there was a special international conference that went on last spring over, over in Richland involving the fast flux test facility reactor. And lo and behold, I was asked if I would come and give a little slide talk, talk about my artwork a little bit. There were nuclear scientists from all over the world that were there. And there was a group of, of German scientists there who make nuclear reactors in Germany. Siemens is the name of their company. They came up to me afterwards and said, hey, we loved your talk. How'd you like some of these things? I said, yeah, geez, are you kidding? You know? <laughs> So as we talk today, 12 breeder blanket assemblies are being loaded on a ship in a port of Leiden, Germany, and they're on their way to Hanford, and you think the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was worried about my fiesta wear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there, there, there's, still, there's still problems to deal with this, but the way we've worked out, we got all the transportation and everything arranged, it's gonna come over and it's gonna be parked safely on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation while I get some sort of a license so that I can work with it. <laughs> But I can't help but feel that in a way, you know, what we human beings do, whether we're artists or whether we're scientists or, or whatever we are, it is all interrelated. I mean, everything belongs to us all. I have had the most profound couple of years in Richland because suddenly I was away from my usual artist crowd. Suddenly I, I was around people that didn't have all the same givens that I did. I'd give slideshow talks to physicists, chemists, metallurgists, engineers. And the first question afterwards would be, what was art again? Uh, why are you making art? And, uh, to utilize nuclear process, to be a nuclear alchemist like my friend Bob. It's a metaphor for the age in which we live, art and science working together, as awkward and as difficult as that might seem sometimes, is the most enriching and profound things, not only for individuals like myself who are caught up with it, but for society as a whole. And I can't help but feel that this sculpture project that I am involved with, with the collaborative help of people like Dr. Schender, will not only enrich the art of sculpture by perhaps returning this ancient and venerable art to the advanced cutting edge of the technologies that are our present civilization today, but I may even in my own way serve as a leavening in this advanced scientific and engineering technologically based community. And I think that the cross-fertilization that comes out of a bridging collaborative project like this is probably good for us all. 
That's basically all I have. The most important thing tonight, I think, is to answer any of your questions that you have afterwards. And if you want to up the lights a little bit, we'll give it a try. I want to thank you very much, Seattle Art Museum 911, for inviting us to come over here. The turnout's amazing. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, Bob, uh, 